of Bible characters, there's probably no more repulsive characters than that of King Ahab and, and Jezebel. In 1 Kings 21, 25, we're told, But there was none like unto Ahab, who did sell himself to work in wickedness in the sight of the Lord. Now, how would you like to have that as an epithet on your tombstone? But it's an epithet for him. In the Word of God, it's been around for a long time. We need to look at him. We need to examine him. And those like him, because these things in the Old Testament, according to Romans 15, 4, were written for our learning. They're very good, inspired object lessons. And we want to look at him in the sense of he's a negative example. We don't want to be like him. We know there are persons who think that negative preaching is not good. In fact, they would even say it's wrong, and in doing so, they become rather negative. But the Bible teaches otherwise. So one of the most apparent faults of this evil, wicked king was covetousness. I think probably this is one, if not the most dangerous and insidious sins known to man. Men have confessed murder. They have confessed lying. They have confessed adultery. And almost every sin known but I've never heard anybody confess to being a covetous person. Have you? Yet covetousness is in the list with all the rest of these that will send a person to torment. One of the reasons is found in the very definition. It's an inordinate desire for something. Inordinate meaning an unlawful desire. We all have desires. God made us with desires. He also gave us a regulator. He gave us his own governor over this physical engine. And if we don't know the Word of God, or if we refuse to live by the Word of God, then God's governor is off of us. And you just won't live right. The Word is sometimes used to signify a strong desire without the implications of evil. The Apostle Paul says to Christians, covet earnestly the best gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, 31, in his instruction regarding uh, their use and abuse of uh, miraculous gifts. This word that the Holy Spirit had Paul use is zelu. It is not, and you can hear the difference, Epithumio. Now that's the usual word, the second one, for covet. But in both Koine Greek and English, the word covet, epithumio, is used as a neutral or good sense as when Jesus said, I have desired, epithumio, to eat this Passover with you. That shows you how strong a desire he had to do that, Luke twenty two fifteen. 15. Now, the context will usually show whether that desire is a proper one or it is not. Remember, the context is the liter literary environment that the word finds itself in. It will always have its root meaning. But then the other things around it are influencing it. Never use its root meaning, but it influence and color it. Who's speaking? Who's being spoken to? What is the subject under consideration? And so on. That sets the context. Paul says in Colossians 3 and verse 5 that there is a covetousness which is idolatry. Now, that word is pleonexia. Pleonexia. And, you know, you can hear the difference in our English pronunciation of the Greek word. It means, though, the desire to have more. Ah, they're Americans. 
They're Americans. And if you think about it for a minute, have you ever had that desire? Two cows more? Of course, the context will determine whether that's a good desire or whether it's a bad desire. Have you ever desired to have more knowledge of the Bible? Have you ever prayed to God for strength to be more in harmony in your everyday living with what the Bible teaches? Have you ever prayed that you'll understand more what's involved in you in an assembly like this, convened for worship, to worship Him in spirit and in truth? To know how to answer every man? How to defend the faith? You want to be better at that? You want to get better at what course? So there may be that earnest, in-depth, sharp desire on your part, an abiding desire, and all those good things. But, pleonexia is always used in the bad sense. And that describes King Ahab's character. This improper desire, notice I say improper, we could say unlawful, desire for money, for power, or anything else like this, is the root of... Of all kinds of evil. That's what the Lord was saying, or what Paul said to Timothy, that the love of money is the root of all evil. If you read it literally in the Greek, it's the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Do we train ourselves to love the right things? Do we train ourselves to do what's necessary to obtain the right things? And I always use right here as the Bible defines what is right. There are some ways to tell for sure whether or not we are covetous in the wrong way. Does the prosperity of others ever pain you? That ought to run up a red flag. Chances are you're not only envious, but covetous. Why can't that be me? If you desire for yourself what another person has, even if it means that you're getting it deprives him of it, a lot of things wrong, but one thing for certain, you're covetous. If we're never satisfied, no matter how much or what we have, we are more likely covetous. In fact, I am persuaded after all these years that a whole lot of things that I've seen in people's lives is causing them all sorts of a mess is that they're never satisfied. There's always that strain to have more of whatever this world is so it can all burn up with the rest of it someday. Now, as important as this lesson on covetous may be, I think there's a broader lesson. And this lesson shows what can happen when a person is actually a slave to circumstances. We're slaves to circumstances when we allow things, things, and circumstances, what's going on, to control our thinking and our happiness. You know, whatever is going on in this world, that pertains to time and space and material things is all going to cease. And really the only people that know how to live in this world as God intended are those that love the Lord to keep His commandments. They're the only ones that know how to use this world and benefit from this world. That's one of the things Jesus meant when He talked about those who would inherit the earth. That is, they learn how to use this life as God intended it. Most people use it as, a, as an end within itself. They're not thinking about, as the prophet said, the long home after this brief period in the flesh is over. They're working as if this will be what it always will be and maybe what I have left I'll leave with my kids or I'll leave it going down. But somewhere that even terminates when the whole world ends. The consequences are rarely good and most of the time they're bad when a person is in this condition, in this frame of mind. 
First of all, they're, they're going to be more agitated than they even know they are because nothing ever works quite right. But everything in this life passes away. It gets used, it grows old, and it's gone. So why build this life? Why not use life as the Bible says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. But we don't. Now look at Paul's attitude in Philippians 4 verse 11. And he wrote that to Christians saying, here's the way it ought to be with you. I mentioned this uh, not long ago. Common statement to us all who study the Bible. Paul, that great man said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I'm going to tell you right now, for a great many people, if not all people, would ever begin to learn part of this and practice it. They would erase so many trials and problems and ups and downs out of their lives. But you have to learn it. I assure you, if the Apostle Paul had to learn it, we have to learn it. But he said, I have learned it. In whatsoever state I am, they're with to be content. I've always kept in mind since I first read it in a poem back probably in college years. In fact, I'm pretty sure it was. Even this shall pass away. Whatever state of affairs you're in that pertains to this physical world, even this will pass away. Now, we don't like to think of it when everything's going well. Everything is feeling good. Everybody's happy. But that's not going to stay that way very long. This is what it seems to me a great many people have failed to get. Is that life just doesn't stay on a, poor, on a smooth path very long. Life is filled with ups and downs and rounds and curves and running into the ditch and maybe worse. Just that way. Because God never intended that this be where our permanent abode is to be. I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. When we do not learn that lesson, we are almost invariably discontented in whatever state we find ourselves. And when you find somebody like that, they're never happy. And they don't really know what's wrong because they're always agitated. You ever noticed that? Years ago when washing machines first came out, they had agitator. I thought, well, you know, just about everybody uh, has somebody that can be an agitator. Well, I suppose in washing machines, that's a good thing. <laughs> but it's not in your life, personally, or in your family. And yet some people have lived their lives being discontent within themselves and making everybody else's life miserable. And part of it is, they don't know why they're here. I do know this. If you try to make the world conform around you and your wishes, you're never going to be happy. Because it's not going to happen. <laughs> Because somebody else has a will and wishes. And there tends to be a collision. We may assume that money, power, possessions, fame, good looks, success, whatever you want to add to those things that are prevalent in this life, that dominate people's lives, are going to give you contentment. They're not going to do it. They will not do it. In fact, they may very well add to your agitation. Do you want to be known as an agitator? Well, if you don't, then you're going to have to learn what am I here for, what am I to do, and where am I going, and then do what God tells you. It's that simple, really. But it doesn't work out that way. Alexander the Great had the whole Medo-Persian Empire and far more conquered. He did it all by the time he was 33. He'd occupied, uh, conquered the world, as it were. But if you read about him, what 
we have that's been brought down to us. He wasn't at rest. In fact, the, he's pictured as sitting on the banks of the river crying because there's no more worlds to come. And this is why the statement of Solomon in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 2 is so valuable to us in living in everyday lives. He who rules his own heart is better than he who taketh a city. That's a marvelous statement. Isn't it amazing how in an economy of words such a profound thing can be stated that impacts us so much? The Bible's full of material like that. If one gets the idea that his present car or house or wherever they're part of town they're living or their clothing, and you can add to the list, is not, I say is not big or glamorous enough, then you know what's going to happen? He's going to be discontent, and he's going to try to discover all sorts of things that are wrong with it or them that he never thought of before because there has to be some sort of justification in his mind to try to get something bigger than better or different anyway. It'll ride rough on the smoothest places, that is, a car will. It'll rattle all over. You're going to find it'll be a general headache until you get that new car. And then it doesn't take too long. You know, it's out of date pretty fast. And someone's got a new one than you. <laughs> And before long, you still got a perfectly good car. But you're ready to get another one. We ought to learn to live in such a way that our happiness and peace and contentment is not controlled by external consequences and circumstances. There are all sorts of things going to happen to us. We can't foresee what will happen to us before the day is over. And it could very well be not good. And we don't know what the circumstances may be that we'll find ourselves in from one day to the next, or one hour to the next for that matter. But the question is, how, do, how is it that we find that happiness and not be controlled by all these external circumstances? Well, first of all, be aware of the truth about it. When, when the prophet Hosea said of God's people due to their ignorance of his word, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, that said, a, as we used to say, a mouthful. It covers so much. You don't even know about your own self like you ought to if you don't know the word of God that pertains to those things. And so it is with this subject. So we have to be aware of the truth about this thing. Know of God's warnings and examples of the Bible and then your own experience. Some people never even learn by their own experience. They just keep committing the same thing. Just keep running over the same route and stumping their toe on it and wondering why. It never seems to them to take a different route <laughs> or to pick the foot up higher. They just keep stumping their toe on it. So we must find happiness in spite of various kinds and degrees of adverse circumstances. Next of all, we need to train our minds, let our mind, our inner being, be so controlled, be so motivated and directed by the values that are spiritual, by the values the Bible says are valuable, that the things that really matter are so important that the external circumstances and situations become insignificant. Whatever happens to me or to you that's peculiar to this life in the flesh is not going to change what the Bible says my duty to God is or what the Bible says one must believe and do to become a Christian or how to live the Christian life, or what the Bible says about the church to which the Lord will add every saved person in its work, its worship, and so on. If you're going to get married, and you just got to have a big house. By the way, as people define big house now, what that might have meant 50 years ago may be different than what it means 50 years from now, who knows. What you're going to do is discover that when you get that big house, you're not going to be happy. And you know why? 
because you're that person living in that house and you took with you what you are and your outlook on life. I've seen it over and over again. The Bible tells us we shouldn't have to make these mistakes once God said, here it is. But you'll see people run from one place to the other, trying to get away from this, that, or the other, but they can't get away from themselves. And some people are so caught up in this in a very extreme, radical way, they try to get away from themselves, so they kill themselves. You know, there's one thing that you need to know. You're never going to get away from yourself. You will always be you, and you will always be somewhere in a certain place. You can make up your mind that happiness in marriage does not depend on the size of the house you'll have. It depends upon having a marriage like the Bible God tells us in it to have. Do you not realize that what we're talking about and in so many other areas, that these things are a result of a choice of will? We make up our minds. We will to this and we will not to that. That's what makes free moral agency such a tremendous thing. The Bible teaches us, such as in Colossians 3, 1 through 2, that we can actually set our mind on certain things. I can will to concentrate on certain things. I can will not to concentrate on them. I choose to be concerned about this. I choose not to be concerned about that. Paul gives a list of things that we are to think about when he wrote the church in Philippi, chapter 4, verse 8. It's interesting he begins it by saying, Finally, brethren... Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honorable, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Think about them. The Bible will help you in every one of those to understand what they mean in your life. But you know, if you follow this statement of Paul in Philippians 4, 8, and you try to go out and make a blockbuster movie, it'll never sell. Because that's not what people want to hear. They're not really interested in things that are true. They're not really interested in the things that are honorable, you look at any movie you want to look at and you see war, you see romance, you see adultery, you see fornication, you see lying, you see cheating, you see fighting, you see this, that, and the other. That's what people want to see. Oh, aren't we so much better than the Romans? We don't have a Colosseum where people were killing one another and fighting beasts. We don't. It's in the mind. We just do it a different way. The result of thinking on these things, as Paul calls them, will bring us happiness and serenity. It'll help us live this life as God intended, to get ready for the next. Most people don't ever think about that. But we, above all, who are members of the church and all that the New Testament defines that to be, should be thinking about it all the time. If you think on these things, you cannot think on the things that cause frustration and anxiety. I think sometimes we ought to have a business meeting and, and we're all going to sit around and describe what frustrates us. And we're all going to talk about what makes us anxious. And we're all going to talk about what makes us fret about everything. And when we get through, we're going to ask, all right, is there a solution? And some dumbbell sitting there might say, yes, it's called the gospel of Jesus Christ and full conversion to Christ and living this life as the New Testament teaches. <coughs> that you are a pilgrim and stranger in this present world. And it's a classroom to get ready for eternity. To be able to stand before the Lord and having lived this life 
getting ready for eternity, that you'll be able to, at the commencement, hear him say, well done, now good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. One result of living for self, and this may sound strange, one result, maybe we call it a consequence, is that one gets tired of himself. <laughs> one gets tired of himself. When a man gets full of himself, he may become allergic to himself. Now, we hear all sorts of things today. I've got allergies to this. But I never heard of anybody say I've got an allergy to myself. But I think sometimes we do. A person becomes self-centered. A person becomes wrapped up in himself or herself. Now, question, if you get in that way, where do you go to get away? Where do you go on vacation? Because you see, old self's going to go with you all the way. There would be no place for God as there ought to be because you're too full of yourself. But only God can provide solutions. And this is why the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 5 and verse 24, They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. You know that was in the Bible? Written to Christians so they can be like Christ and get rid of the frustrations and anxieties and get rid of yourself and quit trying to make everybody center around you? Well, of course it's there. You lose yourself in Christ. How do you do that? You're busy about doing what he tells you to do and being a good citizen of the kingdom. In Romans 6 and verse 6 he says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. You live your life, as the Bible says. The dangers of these undisciplined desires really are, are universal. They're not just confined to those we call rich in this world's goods. They apply to any kind of desire, whether or not we call it coveting. The natural desires are God-given and right. We said that early in the lesson. Undisciplined and undirected by the Lord, they always lead to sin. So you see, inherently, there's nothing wrong with the appetites of the flesh. But they must be regulated by the will of heaven. And since I'm a free moral agent, I must be willing to let God's will rule in my life. Thus, we even sing a song, Let Him have his way with thee. Eve's desire for food was a God-given thing. But she, she was to be regulated by the commands of God. Her desire to have things that delight the eye was not within itself wrong. Her wish to be wise was not in itself sin. When they became undisciplined and undirected by the word of God, then... The will of heaven was transgressed, and that's what sin is, 1 John 3, 4. So I think we can see from this that happiness is not just having material things. Happiness is being a certain kind of person. And only you and only yours truly, only anybody, is the one that can make you the kind of person that will make you a happy person to be around make you a better wife and mother and husband and father and friend and above all, a good citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Happiness just doesn't come from having material things. A good person will do more with the more he has to do with, but he has to be a good person first. And we have to go to the Bible to find out what a good person is. If you're a wicked person, having more just means you'll probably do many more wicked things. So it's not the things. It's the disposition of your mind toward yourself and toward life in general and how you deal with everybody else. When God promises, the God of peace shall be with you, Philippians 4 and verse 9. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds. Through Jesus Christ. If you're ever in your frustration sometime, especially when you're raising several children, said, oh, just for some peace of mind. 
Well, the kind of peace he's talking about is where you know your sins are forgiven, you're reconciled to God, and you're letting Jesus have his way with you through your submission to his will, and you're searching the scriptures to learn better how to live life, and whatever problem comes upon you, you know the Bible has the answer, and you're going to find it in that, and you're willing to do what is necessary to comply with those things. Now notice what we've read here is all contingent upon a person being a Christian and all that the New Testament defines a Christian to be. There's great value in our knowledge of how to deal with temptations, those things that test our confidence, faith, belief in God, or efforts of Satan to solicit us to violate his will. And this is true then of covetousness. First, don't be like the Old Testament character, Balaam. He kept playing around with the idea, though he already knew what God's will was. But he wanted the money. Temptation seems to have some kind of, um, lack of a better way to put it, hypnotic power if we keep looking at them. Second, run from those things. Flee these things, as Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 11. Don't get involved with them, and they can't be there to bother you. Whether the temptation is fornication, 1 Corinthians 6, 18, or idolatry, whatever it may be, something that comes before God, 1 Corinthians 10, 14, or the desire for possessions, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10. And that's important advice if you want to keep yourself out of the snares of the devil. Now, every person, along with God, knows what your particular weakness is because we each have our own weaknesses. But if we can know what our weaknesses are, then why can't we bolster up that area in our life? We should find out what they are and be especially on guard to muzzle or to curb or to kill them. Jesus shows the effort that ought to be put into it and the extreme to which we should go to keep ourselves in pleasing in God's sight when he said, If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, Matthew 5, 29. There's no sacrifice any of us should think is too great when you consider the reward of eternal life in heaven. Hebrews 12, 1 gives us more dimension of the whole thing. After saying laying aside or lay aside every sin, he adds looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Well, there's the problem. We rarely look at the last will and testament of the Christ or the Bible as a whole to see how to live this life. Uh, we all have our cell phones. We all have these, what do you call them? Goes on your card, tell you which way to go. Yeah, GPS. The Word of God is your GPS to heaven. The Word of God gives you direction in your life. And we must keep Him foremost in our mind and His will being done in our mind in every situation. The tenderness and long-suffering of God in Ahab's case and in ours is amazing. You remember the prophet Elijah warned him and gave him opportunity after opportunity to repent. As you go to Noah and look at his case, uh, or Israel's case, or as Jeff was talking about this morning in class when it comes to Judah, the time of the fall, uh, or our case, God bears with us. But there comes an end to that. There comes an end to it. Sometimes we stress that it's hard to get to heaven. Well, when you have the proper converted disposition that God knows the way to heaven, then anything he asks you to do becomes an easier thing to do because of the end result. Considered from another standpoint, we might say that God has tried to make it hard to go to hell. We must fight against our own attitude, state of mind, even our own conscience. We must try to eradicate precious memories of family, brethren, and the others who tried to lead us in the right way if we go to hell. 
We must deliberately close our eyes to the ruin sin makes of others' lives and deliberately refuse to accept the warnings we know are right. We, we must constantly rebel against those who we think are trying to control us. We must deliberately shut out the picture we see of Christ loving us enough to die for us. We must break these and many other barriers that God has put up to keep us out of eternal torment in the devil's hell. Perhaps the most impressive lesson we get from this biblical account of Ahab and Jezebel and others like him, really, is that there will be payday someday. Ahab and Jezebel may have relaxed in the thought that they had covered their tracks or so they looked at it, but they hadn't. Wages of sin is death. And when you see the loose living that's going on in America that is being from every side promoted as being normal naturally and that's all right, what do you think is going to happen when it comes to venereal diseases, broken homes, deaths from drunken driving, all sorts of other things that produce bad results may and do come and they're happening right now. But you're not seeing all that brought out. And there are those wages, of course, that may not be paid and will not be paid until eternity. But listen, they're going to be paid. There's no escaping it. If we accept the payment that Jesus Christ made on the cross, believing and obeying the gospel of Christ, repenting of our sins, confessing our faith in Him, and being baptized for the remission of sins, fully converted to Christ in His way, and in the church, the spiritual body of Christ, serving Him faithfully, we don't have to make that payment. That's what redeemed means. The Lord's bought us. We're not our own. We're bought with a price. Our Lord told life and death were the opposite of covetousness. He loved us and gave so that ours could be with Him. Our lives could be with Him in glory someday. And as we look at Ahab and then we look at Jesus, we can deliberately choose the one that appeals to us the most. It's hard to imagine that one can understand this message from God's great and wonderful and good word and choose the way they have. But my experience and observation leads me to the sad conclusion that many will. But we don't have to. You can be the exception. In fact, anybody that goes to heaven, it will be the exception. You can continue to live like the world, building your hopes in this world. It's all going to be dashed. Or you can live this world in preparation for heaven. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Ahab didn't know that, didn't care to know that, neither did Jezebel. They encouraged one another to be heinous and wicked, reject God had every opportunity to be what they ought to be. Well, look at us. So how do we choose? How do we keep the church, the Lord's church? How do we keep each one of our lives faithful to God? How do we rear our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? How do we become a good example to all those round about us? It's going to be by adherence to the will of heaven, letting him have his way with me. If you're a child of God and you sinned and you need to repent of those sins and pray God for forgiveness. We studied the plan of salvation briefly. We've seen where your interest ought to be, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And will it be there? But now whatever your need is spiritually, we've given you the solution to it in becoming a Christian and in correcting things in your life as a child of God. If you need to obey the truth, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.